Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I sit on the Board of Trustees of the International Menopause Society. Today, I'm joined by Professor Richard Anderson. Hello. Could you introduce yourself to our audience and tell them what you do? Thanks, Marla. Yeah, uh, my name is Richard Anderson. I'm Professor of Clinical Reproductive Science at the University of Edinburgh, and I research into uh, the female reproductive lifespan. Um, that's one of my key research interests, and I work clinically in looking after couples with infertility and in men and women with reproductive endocrine disorders. So there's a hormone. I know that for my female patients who have issues with fertility, they talk about getting this blood test, AMH or anti-malarian hormone. What is this hormone? It's certainly not a mainstream hormone that most women know about. And what's its role? So AMH, anti-malarian hormone, has really become sort of, you know, a very exciting new hormone over the last few years, or uh, probably a decade or two now, in fact. Um, and it's really been interesting working in the field to see how it has really revolutionized a lot of our understanding of uh, the, how the ovary works and what we can see going on within the ovary that we really couldn't do with previous hormones. Uh, and the secret with that is that AMH isn't about whether you're ovulating at the moment. It doesn't go up and down on a week by week cycle like uh, estrogen does, like the other hormones that come from the ovary. It's at a much more stable level. And it's really looking at the activity of the smaller follicles within the ovary that are sort of driving then the potential for ovulation thereafter. And I like to think of it as sort of ovulation is sort of a bit the party trick of the ovary. It's the swan cruising along on the, on the surface looking gorgeous. Uh, and the AMH is the feet paddling furiously underneath that's keeping the whole ship afloat. So what purpose does it have when you measure this hormone? What would it tell you about a woman? So the main established role in medicine at the moment for measuring AMH is in women about to have an IVF cycle, where it's really useful to predict how well that woman's ovaries are going to respond to the stimulation involved in IVF. Are they going to over-respond, potentially make her unwell with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? Or is it going to indicate that actually her ovaries are really not going to respond great, that, that things are really, you know, and you know, not in a great place and you're a bit up against it. And that allows everyone to go on or so to go into the IVF cycle with their expectations sort of adjusted to whether this is going to begin going well or we've got a bit of an issue here. So that's really established. What it's not really good at is as an overall fertility test, because I say it's not about whether you're ovulating. And if you're trying to get pregnant, the key thing is, are you ovulating or not? So it's a more uh, sort of secondary role in that regards. So it sounds as sort of more about the health of the ovary than it is about the predictable function. Yeah, it's all about actually the sort of the, the, what's going on in terms of the background activity of the ovary and therefore how that's going to how long it might continue to work, for example. And, you know, in particular in relation to the, the, the IMS um, about its decline, and it does decline right down to undetectable levels around the time of the menopause. So that's the next question I was going to ask you, AMH and the life cycle of women. Can this be used to predict menopause or can it be used to diagnose menopause? Two different things. We don't have a very good predictor test for women when there begins to have some cycle irregularity. Yeah, so at the moment, it's not part of the, sort of the diagnostic workup of, of even diagnosing the menopause. Although in a woman who has no AMH and has, she has stopped having cycles, she, her periods have stopped, then clearly, you know, that does reinforce that she's menopausal. But it probably doesn't add hugely to existing tests at the moment. So the, the question is, does it then predict the menopause? Can you say, well, actually, I'm going to go through the menopause in 10 years time or not? And it, it actually, so that this is something that's been studied and it really isn't a great predictor in that regard. You know, you think it might do because it does decline to the menopause and you might think, well, we can predict that, but it doesn't seem to work out terribly accurately um, because age and other things also have an important, um, you know, factor into that equation. But what it does say is that if your periods are stopping and your AMH is still detectable, then it means your, the likelihood is your periods are actually going to continue for quite a while yet. So it's better predicting that your, over, your, your periods are going to continue than saying they're actually about to stop. And then there's a group of, of women, um, sometimes they're younger women, with premature ovarian insufficiency. So in other words, the ovaries begin to fail 
sooner than we think they would. And we worry about their fertility. We worry about the length of their cycles. Should we be treating them with estrogen? Is there a role for AMH in helping this particular group of women, the so-called POI women? So I think this is going to be a really important value of this, of measuring um, AMH in women with um, POI and the early stage of the diagnosis, because what often happens with particularly very young women, teenagers and the women in their early 20s, there's, there's often a sort of quite a delay in those women getting the right diagnosis, because it, it is such a catastrophic diagnosis for women to make. I think doctors are often reluctant, you know, general family practitioners are often reluctant to say to a woman, this is what these blood tests say because it's such bad news. So I think AMH will be useful in really clarifying what's going on with those women when the periods perhaps are, you know, sometimes in the early stages, the periods come and go a bit, it can be a bit fluctuant. And I think it can be useful to try and really identify what's going on in that group of, of young women who are facing this really difficult time. So more information evolving in this particular hormone. It sounds as if this hormone is, is just about to, if not explode, become certainly more important in mainstream medicine and perhaps helpful for women in many stages um, through their growth and development. Yeah, I think so, Mala. I think we, we've become very, uh, it's become very much an established hormone in, in more specialist reproductive medicine circles, um, you know, and that's now absolutely an everyday process for women having assisted reproduction. I think the exciting thing in the future is really exploring what it can offer women in, in other areas of their reproductive health. And also, I think, of course, being aware of the limitations, what it can't do. It isn't a great fertility test. It isn't a great predictor of when you might go through the menopause. So I think we need to just be aware of its limitations uh, as well as its value. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.